My name is Casey Foster, he, him, my pronouns. I am the co-executive director at Partners for the Union Rights. And this is a part of our new social contract webinar series from the ground up, community-centered policies for equitable development. And I am in Brooklyn, I'm in uh, Fort Greene, where we are like many other people across the world right now experience a heat wave. So my windows are wide open and my neighbor's speakers are turned all the way up. Um, if folks hear any um, background music coming from uh, coming from me right now, um, enjoy it. So as I mentioned, uh, we have a great panel for tonight's conversation. I'll get into some more formal um, introductions a little bit of our panel. We have Tomas Rivera um, from the Chain Breakers Collective, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Sofia Lopez um, from Acre Campaigns, um, and Dr. James D. Philippus from Rutgers and the Western Queens community land trust. But first, I wanted to ground us uh, a little bit in, in where we are right now in the moment that we're in. Um, and, you know, we are in a moment where we are still very much navigating a health pandemic the likes of none of us have ever seen. And we are in a moment where um, the protections that were fought for and won um, for many low income renters, so eviction moratoriums um, are coming to an end or have ended all across the country. We are seeing um, homelessness on a rise all across the country. We are seeing rents skyrocket across the country. We are seeing corporate landlords come in and buy up properties across the country. And in the face of these daunting challenges, um, we are also in a moment where we've seen relentless, inspiring, innovative organizing uh, across the country from tenant housing organizers to community land organizers um, in really every corner of the country. I think there's lessons that we can pull from the way people have organized throughout the pandemic and continue to organize. And, you know, for us uh, at Partners for Dignity and Rights, the impetus for this conversation comes from our work over a decade supporting housing and community land organizers in Baltimore. And during the last decade before the murder of Freddie Gray and the ensuing rebellion, a collection of organizers in Baltimore began building a coalition around equitable development, seeing the links between the downtown business government subsidies, to low wage employment, people returning from incarceration, vacant housing, the loss and privatization of public housing and gentrification, they embarked upon a campaign to use two thirds of the city's bond budget to deconstruct and rehab vacant housing by employing people returning from incarceration and creating a city supported network of community land trusts to operationalize it. The campaign got a lot of attraction, even though it didn't reach its ultimate goals. However, the coalition did win an affordable housing trust governed predominantly by community members and securing a property transfer surtax on sales above a million dollars targeted to the fund. It then mobilized successfully to push the fund to prioritize community land ownership and CLTs and work to support burgeoning CLTs by forming a community land trust network called Share Baltimore. The work in Baltimore continues. We continue to support that work and the innovative and brave organizers there who have been challenged by COVID, and capitalist forces driving extraction of communal resources and exploitation of labor. Our recently released report from the ground up Community-Centered Policies for Equitable Development draws from some of those lessons learned in Baltimore. We explore a path towards community-controlled development to benefit community members, not corporate landlords and real estate investors. Every attempt by tenants to take over their building, eliminate substandard housing, increase public and social housing, affirmatively further fair housing or fights against powerful political and economic alignments. There's no low-hanging fruit here, and our guests know that firsthand. And they've been doing the work and supporting the work that's similar to the work that we're supporting in Baltimore and that's taking root all over our country. So I wanna in, uh, introduce everyone to our guest tonight. From the Chain Breaker Collective in Santa Fe, we have the executive director, Thomas Rivera. Chain Breaker helped author a report seven years ago on equitable development and the risk of displacement that profiled four Santa Fe neighborhoods. Two years ago, they released another one on health, healing, and housing. Santa Fe is like many cities in the U.S. beset by hyperinvestment in some neighborhoods and a history of divestment in others. Chainbreaker is a grassroots-led agent of community-driven equitable development, and we're proud uh, and honored to have Tomas join us tonight. Sofia Lopez comes to us from Acre, the Action Center on Race and the Economy, 
which is a campaign hub for organizations working at the intersection of racial justice and Wall Street accountability using an explicit racial lens. It recently released a study of the Wall Street infrastructure that is aggressively consuming the single family land landlord industry entitled the National Rental Home Council, how America's largest single family landlords put profit over people. We're pleased that Sofia Lopez, a co-author of that report from Acre is with us this evening. And finally, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. James DeFilippis, who's an academic grounded in community organizing and action and a founding member of the Western Queens Community Land Trust. He has worked with community land trusts, community organizers, and written about alternative finance institutions long before the public banking movement came in the vogue. We're glad to have him join us tonight. And so I want to take no further time out of everyone's night and go right to our panelists. And so our first question tonight is for Sophia. Why is this? I opened up a little bit with some of the grounding, um, talking about growth corporate landlords. But why is this happening now in, in terms of corporate landlords growth in, in buying up single family homes? What's different this time kind of looking now as opposed to back in 2008? Thanks, Casey. And hi, everyone. So nice to be here with you all. As Casey mentioned, a lot of my work has focused recently on single family rental landlords, though that's not the only place where corporate landlords and all of the different kinds of financial arrangements like REITs and LLCs you know, have, have moved into our homes. But the story with single family rentals really dates back to the 2008 financial crisis. As we all know here, millions of people, particularly households of color, lost their homes to foreclosure. And in thousands of instances, these large institutional landlords like Invitation Homes created by Blackstone, the private equity firm, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, ended up buying thousands and thousands of these homes at auction, often facilitated by the federal government, whether that was buying the loans directly from the federal government or getting massive, massively beneficial, very low cost loan guarantees from the federal government. So really, I mean, this was a, an industry that was created and propped up with a lot of support, unfortunately, uh, from federal actors. I just wanna clarify, I'm gonna say institutional landlords a couple of times. And when I say that, I mean, these are large scale landlords that are backed by private equity or money that comes from the public or private sectors that could be pensions, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, those kinds of financial actors that really are so difficult to trace. And I can't tell you in how many instances I've worked with tenants who've told me, you know, I don't understand where my landlord is getting this money. They're able to buy all of these buildings cash. It doesn't really make sense. And, and, and it's really difficult to know who actually owns the building that people are living in. Um, but going, continuing with our, our little history lesson. So this industry on the scale, basically it didn't exist until as recently as 2012. That's when a lot of these companies initially started to form. A lot of them talked about this really exciting beneficial moment where they recognize that so many people would be locked out of homeownership or really the option to live in many different kinds of housing arrangements for the long term. And so really they, they started to pull up these massive amounts of money to be able to buy more and more and more of our homes, um, knowing that people really wouldn't have anywhere else to go. And I'll say, you know, a lot of these companies say things like, well, we only control 2% of the market. We're not that big. We're so small. Why are you paying attention to us? But the reality is when we look down at the city level, that's not the case at all. They've actually decided to concentrate very heavily in certain markets. We know Memphis is one of the cities where they're most heavily concentrated. For Charlotte, North Carolina, it's estimated they own as many as one in every four single family rentals. And I've heard from organizers working in Charlotte that leaves tenants in a situation where a lot of them maybe decide to leave one of their single family rental landlords only to try and find a new home and find themselves in a situation where really the only options they have are more of these kinds of companies who all have generally the same kinds of practices. I'll mention also, you know, so I've heard a couple of the companies say, well, we saw that this industry was recession proof in the 2008 crisis. Now there's this opportunity that many of them saw as really potentially very advantageous through the COVID-19 crisis. So they took advantage of the moment to raise tons and tons of money. I've seen estimates that some of these companies raised as many as $50 billion that they haven't fully deployed yet. So all of the investment that we've seen and read about is really only maybe like a little bit more than half of the story. 
I've seen some speculation that this sector of the industry, they say that they're 2% now, right? But they're primed to grow to as much as 50% of all single family rentals within the next five years. I've seen another estimate that says that they'll grow by 1 million units within the next 10 years. And that would actually bring them closer in line with the kinds of numbers we see in multifamily where large corporate landlords. So that includes these large REITs, these huge corporations, own as many as 60% of all of the rental units in the US. So really, I mean, we're seeing pro pandemic or disaster profiteering at its worst right now. And I think that's exactly why we're in this kind of situation where there are so many headlines and so much concern about this rapid consolidation. I'll try to keep the last half of what I have to say quick, but basically, you know, I, from what I've read in my work with tenant organizers, what I see that the business practices for these landlords fall into five primary categories. So these are really dramatic rent increases. And I'll just pull out a couple of examples. So for example, Invitation Homes on their third quarter earnings call said that they had raised rents in Phoenix by 30%, 29% in Las Vegas, 21% in Tampa, 20% in Atlanta, 19% in Jacksonville, Florida. And this is a year in which they increased their profits by 33% or 65 million from 2020 to 2021. So we see where all the money is coming from, right? The next practice would be huge fines and fees. So Tricon Residential is another one of these single family rental landlord companies. They reported they were able to take in $640 per home per month in fee and other revenue. And when they talk about this fee and other revenue, they're talking about things like requiring people to pay for renter's insurance, or the cost of things like air filter replacement. They're generating this much revenue from these kinds of tactics. And they actually told their investors that they anticipated increasing this kind of revenue per home per month to between $850 to $950 per month. That's on top of rent, which is just completely outrageous. Um, and then there's a lack of maintenance, right? So in 2021, Minneapolis tenants living in properties that were owned by Havenbrook Homes shared with me that they reported waiting up to a year for necessary and urgent repairs. These included holes in roofs and ceilings, broken stairways, lead paint, flooding, faulty electrical systems, broken and inoperable appliances, pest infestation, black mold, and more. And the following year in 2022, the city of Columbia Heights, the suburb of Minneapolis, actually revoked this company's license based on conditions that were so bad they were deemed to be putting residents' lives at risk. And then evictions, the fourth main. Uh, tactic that I've seen these companies pursue. So oftentimes these things are driven by the kinds of financing they get. So one example, you know, these companies underwrite securities based on tenants' rents, which is a whole other issue. But part of the assumptions that they underwrite include things like 94% paying occupancy. So when people fall behind, that means in order to kind of fulfill the commitments or the promises they make to the people who buy their securities, they have to take action against people who aren't paying. So obviously this becomes a huge issue during something like a pandemic when we have millions upon millions of people who lose their jobs and suddenly don't have a way to pay rent. And then lastly, I'll say, you know, they do, there's this intensely confusing convoluted ownership structure where it's difficult to know where the money is coming from to finance some of these purchases. But then also, as I'm sure many of you have seen, there are these very um, opaque LLC structures that you know, in good instances, you're able to research, you know, when you're lucky, you're able to research and understand who owns the building. And that's usually like a three-step process, but there are plenty of other times where you just end up at a dead end and people, you know, tenants don't know where to go when they're having an issue and the company that they're renting from isn't responsive at all. So in one of the reports that was dropped in the chat, you can see we recommend tenant protections is the best way to ensure that people are living with dignity in their homes. That includes protections from outrageous rent increases and huge fines and fees, things like a tenant right to counsel and a right to organize so the tenants can actually address horrible conditions in their homes and things like just cause eviction so tenants aren't evicted from their homes without an actual reason. We saw recently that there was proposed legislation in New York State that also included protections from large rent increases and fines and fees. And then lastly, we call for transparency and ownership and things like anti-speculation taxes and definitely public banking as an option to avoid the kinds of speculative finance that require these kinds of landlords maximize their profits. And I'll just say last thing, we know that these policies don't happen in a vacuum, right? These companies and their leadership are all very politically connected and politically powerful. So I'll say for me at Acre, it's a complete 
pleasure and honor to be able to do the work that I do alongside and with tenants who are organizing to fight back in the conditions in their homes against some of the largest landlords in the country. Um, so I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks. Thank you, Sophia. I think there are two solutions that you brought forth. One was right to counsel, um, which I know was a campaign that started with tenant organizers in New York City, but has taken root in a number of, of cities. And then just cause eviction is an, another solution you mentioned, which got close this year in New York and had passed in some municipalities throughout New York State. Unfortunately, I think the court just took away that victory, I believe in, in Albany, because the courts have a habit of taking away our victories. But, the, you know, the, the, the organizing through tenants, you know, right to counsel and just cause eviction brings me to Tomas, where in Santa Fe, people are organizing in many ways to protect from eviction, but also to control land and development. And so my question, Tomas, is the Chainbreaker Collective in Santa Fe partnered with others in 2020 to do a report on health and housing, noting the opportunities in developing city-owned property at the Midtown campus, in which you set forth principles of a healthy Santa Fe and promoted community land trust as a solution. What is Chainbreaker's vision for community land trust and why community land trust as a solution during this time? Yeah, thank you and thanks for having us here. So just for a little bit of background, uh, Chainbreaker is a membership-led economic and environmental justice organization based here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We primarily organize low-income people of color, which is predominantly Latinx people here in Santa Fe. There's a long history, Santa Fe is a smaller city, but a long history of dealing with big city issues like ongoing displacement and segregation, uh, gentrification and these housing issues that we're dealing with here. Um, I think that they're happening in cities like Santa Fe, smaller cities even than ours, and of course the larger metropolitan places. They started before COVID, long before COVID, and have been exacerbated and sort of hit the fast forward button there. So really what we're looking at is deeply ingrained systemic issues with how we think about housing in our society here. And so in Santa Fe, we've been working on anti-displacement work for about 18 years. And so I think there's a couple components that brought us to a place of calling for a community land trust. One of our primary neighborhoods where the majority of our, our members live is literally now across the street from a 64 acre piece of city owned land that is suddenly vacant. It's a former um, college um, that has um, suddenly been available. So that's 2018, actually, I say suddenly, that was 2018 that that happened. Um, the city's trying to figure out what to do with it. Now we know as, as doing this work for a long time, no matter what gets built on this property is gonna increase displacement pressure on the surrounding neighborhoods, which are already incredibly vulnerable to gentrification have all of the markers of their, you know, years and years of disinvestment, predominantly, you know, low income people of color who just can't absorb the erratic whims of the market, the housing market that we're dealing with. So we kind of jumped into a campaign to make sure that we do everything we can to, to push back on this and to insulate our community as much as possible. Now, I think a lot of the policies that are being mentioned are, are very obvious to a lot of our members, things like rent control, just cause evictions, right to counsel, all of the things that are being mentioned here really are, are sort of the preventative stop the stop the mass displacement that happens so quickly when a big development like this happens. And so we, you know, we, we definitely um, look at those, but when it came to figuring out, well, what is something, what is something beyond that? How can we think of, how can we think housing in Santa Fe and really try to articulate housing as a human right, which is fundamentally the value that we're starting off with that we believe in. And what that led us to very quickly was a community land trust. And so a community land trust is a model of collective ownership and stewardship over land and housing, is one that we know helps people, like I said, insulate from the erratic whims of the market in the long term. And we really wanted to take this and say, this example has worked across the country. What could it do in Santa Fe on such a large scale of land? This is public land. This is something that we have at least some political access to here in Santa Fe. How can we sort of propose this and say, what is the dream of turning 64 acres into something, public lands and public hands? And so, um, you know, I think like what people are saying, there is no silver, silver bullet. I love that, you know, you said right at the beginning, there is no low hanging fruit with what we're talking about. These are all very 
deeply ingrained um, systemic issues that we are in an uphill battle about. But we're not starting from scratch, right? We talk about silver buckshot. There are solutions and a community land trust is one of them. So when I think it comes down to what is the vision for community land trusts, of course, we could get into some of the policy conversations. And, you know, if you look to the reports that have been shared there, um, it is very clear to us that when, you, when you're in situations like the COVID pandemic, like what happened in 2008, like what tends to happen when, when we're in these sort of markets that kind of fluctuate in the ways that they do, uh, there are obvious solutions like community land trusts out there. And so this is not new information. This is something we've known for a long time. Fundamentally, the vision behind what we're talking about, though, is about people. You know, we always say when we're having this conversation is Chainbreaker is not a housing organization. We are a civil rights organization. We are a social justice organization. And housing is a, a social justice issue. It's a civil rights issue. It is fundamentally a human rights issue. And so if we think about it in those terms, we stop asking ourselves questions that lend towards the commodification of housing and start moving towards how do we actually think of this as a community resource that we have available to us. So when we think of this campaign for the 64 acres of land to turn into a land trust, we're actually asking ourselves, how can we come off the back foot and say, you know, we have generations and generations of segregation and displacement and gentrification that we've been fighting. There's uh, ongoing uh, community level trauma that we're dealing with there and trying to start healing from. And so I think that we really come at this place and we say it a lot in Santa Fe, we wanna preserve our history, we wanna preserve our culture. And I think that a lot of the sort of the, I don't wanna call them smaller because there is no low hanging fruit, but things like just cause evictions policies, which are very heavy lifts or rent control, that's still just saying, how do we stop the bleeding? What a community land trust actually says is how do we envision a world and a future and a Santa Fe that has us in it, not just for this current generation, but for generations down the line. And so, you know, we really want to encourage people to think in those terms. How do we take housing and start thinking about it in terms of the people who are inside the houses? What are the lives that they lead? How can we think about making sure that these are fully formed communities that have all of the support systems in there? And when we start having that conversation from a community a collective ownership, a collective stewardship framework, we start answering questions that seem very obvious about things like food access, things like access to health, things like parks, things like open spaces, become the natural thing to flow outside of conversations just about profit and equity and things that just are out of reach for so many of, of our folks there. So I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to uh, encourage us to Yes, we should look at the policies. We should look at the actual political, legal, and financial mechanisms that allow for this kind of thing to happen. But that's happened before, right? Here, there's people on the call here. That's figure outable, we like to say, right? Let's lean towards the dream, though, behind it. Like, what does the future look like in a world where people aren't falling constant prey to pro profit over people? And that's, to us, a community land trust is actually just the first step towards that. So. Um, we're looking forward to, to doing that. And I, I guess I can leave it there for now. I know that there's more questions to be had, but um, you know, that, again, just want to encourage us to think in those terms. How are the people affected by this? No, that, that, that's great. I want to kind of build off Tomas's answer there and, and, and go to James. And one of the takeaways that we've had in Baltimore with folks in Baltimore been a challenge is, is scale, right? Specifically around solutions that are building a different future, community land trusts, ownership of land. You know, there's been a challenge of how do we take this to scale? And I know for me, the first time I heard about community land trusts, I believe it was a community organization in Austin, Texas, on the historically black side of Austin that had, that had established a community land trust. And I'm in New York, and I thought that's an amazing idea. How do you do that? in New York, right? Like maybe Hollis where my grandfather is, like that maybe is a similar community to what Austin looks like. But James, you're in Queens, in, in Western Queens with the Western Queens Community Land Trust, which is a very dense area. And so when we talk about community land trust being an alternative and, and an answer for us building a different future, 
how is the Western Queens Community Land Trust thinking of community land trusts as something that we can bring to scale? I think the scale question is really complicated. And first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this conversation. It's so exciting to me. I'm very happy to be learning from my partners and colleagues in, uh, around the country. And in the really excellent report that is sort of part of this that was just put in the, um, in the chat. A scale is a super hard question because on the one hand, we are rooted in communities, right? In, in shared understandings and experiences and relationships. And that, that doesn't map on very well to kind of organizational bigness, right? And, and we haven't done a great job of figuring out ways that you can sort of have larger orgs up here while retaining the sort of, you know, very strong neighborhood kinds of roots, right? And the CLT universe and, you know, and, and besides my, my work in, in New York, uh, you know, I study them and write about them. You know, there are an awful lot of kind of citywide CLTs that are actually, and some of them are quite good, right? Like I, yeah, I think City of Lakes in Minneapolis is a great shop, right? That does really good work with the residents on their land, but they're not community based, right? Like their their turf is got three hundred ninety thousand people in it, you know, and to the City of Minneapolis. Right. Like there, there are many, many, you know, you're just going from one part of the, you know, in the north side of Minneapolis to another part, you're in, in a different community. So I think about scale. When I think about scale, I think about scaling up the movement. Right. And, and and the movement part of it, not the kind of politician grabbed onto this. You know, I'm the city of Chicago. I demoed all my public housing and then I'm like, God, I need to figure out how to kind of do permanently affordable housing because I just demoed all this permanently affordable housing. So I'm going to create a CLT, but you're not a CLT, right? You're just, you're, you're doing housing that is, you know, permanently affordable, but you're not a community land trust, right? Like, because there is no community governance. There is no democracy in, in the decision-making, right? Like the you know, or you look at, uh, uh, you know, the one that Flagstaff, Arizona set up, or the one that Irvine, California set up, um, or the one that Mayo Clinic in Rochester, you know, so there are a ton of them out there. Forget about those, right? Like they're there, the, the movement ones, the ones rooted in an understanding of racial and economic justice have to be thinking about scale in terms of building up the movement rather than sort of bigger or. You know, and so in in New York, right? Like we were, we formed actually long before Western Queens was uh, it was created as a CLT. We created in the fall of 2012. It was organizers who picture the homeless in 2012 in, in the South Bronx at the time, but 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 sort of a broader organizing group for the homeless people in, in New York City pulled together a bunch of folks, some you know lawyers, 596 acres, and and technical assistance folks at the New Economy Project, and, and a few of us academics as well to kind of support what came to be nicely, the New York City Community Land Mission, right? And so we were, you know, at the time we had one CLT in New York City um, in Cooper Square on the Lower East Side. We now have more than a dozen that are either, you know, actively in formation or have already established themselves, some of which already are developing their housing portfolio um, you know, particularly in, in East Harlem, um, where there are a set of properties that, that the city finally, after many years of fighting, um, are turning over to us, right? Our story in Western Queens was Amazon announces its arrival in fall of 2018. It's, you know, it's a done deal, right? The governor and the mayor, the only thing to have ever agreed upon in the history of ever is to give over $4 billion to Amazon, right? Like that, otherwise they, they would fight all. So, you know, they both agreed it was a done deal. And then a whole bunch of organizations fought against it. And to everybody's kind of surprised, in February of, of 19, Amazon pulled out. And then through that spring and, and summer, we started having all of these conversations. There was a big citywide economic democracy conference that was organized that had about 80 or 90 different orgs and, and some labor um, as well at this economic democracy conference. And, and some of the Bronx organizers were really pushing the question of, okay, what do we do after no, right? What comes after no? What comes after we we successfully fight back? How do we build forward, right? You know, to use a language that we always use in nicely is sort of simultaneously fighting back and fighting forward, right? And so we decided that we were going to organize around 
the 600,000 square foot Department of Education building in that the city and state were going to demo and turn over to Amazon, the 1938 Public Works building, and we're going to turn it into a mixed-use facility. We partner up with a whole set of organizations in and around Western Queens, um, Street Vendors Project. One of the things that people, that happens when um, gentrification comes is lower value industrial uses get pushed out really quickly, right? So all the commissary kitchens that are required by law for in New York City for street vendors to have a license so the cops don't push them around, those all go, right? And so we have, you know, if you look at Western Queens, the neighborhoods going east from Long Island City are anywhere from two thirds to 80% to 85% foreign born, right? If you go from Corona, you know, and, and flushing all the way to, to Long Island City, it's overwhelmingly foreign born. This is the heart of immigrant New York City in many ways. And, and street vendors are very much part of household livelihoods and the kind of, and daily life. And a lot of folks are undocumented. And so the cops pushing them around, not just the hassle of the ticket, although there is the hassle of the ticket, you know, there, there are bigger implications. So we work with the Street Vendors Project on that. We have, we partnered with uh, food justice organizers on a food co-op. We partner with a set of nonprofits, you know, designate space. There are a whole set of different parts to it. I can't go into too much more because I realize I'm taking up too much time. But I think the idea for us was that we were going to start with a big project. We're not going to be the developer because we don't have any skills as a developer. You know, we partnering up with a not-for-profit developer that we trust to do the development. And I'll end very briefly with getting at the question of why is the stuff all so small all the time, um, which is sort of inherent in your question, Jesse, is sort of why, you know, why can't we scale up, right? And, and the answer to me centrally comes actually from a, a framework that you um, talk about in, in the Partnership for Dignity and Rights report on the kind of centrality of property value appreciation in municipal government thinking. But I would also add to that the further petty politics part of it, the municipal governments don't control a ton, right? They, you know, one of the things they do control is land. And the idea that they would be sort of enabling of frameworks to build out, you know, a rival sort of way of controlling and, and making decisions over the use of land in their jurisdiction, that's a hard sell beyond just the property value increases, right? And so it really does, these are, endless political fights. It's, it's not necessarily about the org structure per se. It's about the, the politics of what we're trying to do. Thank you for that, James. And that I'm going to switch up our formatting a little bit because I, we have a question from a participant that I want to bring into this space a little early tonight because I think it's it's a pretty interesting question. But James, I mean, James, you mentioned this organization, Picture the Homeless, which organized homeless people in, in East Harlem, but but really throughout New York City. And I actually want to bring a friend of mine into this space, um, Nikita Price, who is no longer with us, who passed away, who was a longtime organizer with Picture the Homeless and a mentor to many of us here organizing in New York, because I think Tomas said this is this is about people and, and this is about building a movement. And I think Nikita and, and Picture the Homeless um, really encapsulated that for so many of us here. And it's about the narratives that we build around people. Right. It's about the narratives that are built around people that live in deplorable housing. Right. That like that's partly their fault because they are not successful. And that's, you know, their problem to work out or homeless people kind of being blamed, you know, individualized for being homeless. Right. And so there's, you know, I think Tomas mentioned there's other narratives about community empowering our community to control land and develop land. But there's some tension um, that Tisha that uh, apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name um, right brought into the Q&A, which is, you know, speaking of returning the land back to the community, what are your thoughts on co-ops and right to first refusal and other models of collective housing and land ownership? Because there's pushback even on the grassroots level around the collective ownership dynamic due to the narrative of land home ownership being the most effective wealth building avenues. So I'm curious to hear thoughts um, from our panelists on that. Sure. Yeah, I feel like all of us probably have lots to say on this question. I really appreciate you for lifting it up, Casey, and also Tisha for you, you for asking it. I mean, I think, you know, I'll say I gave this very like high level summary of what some of the issues are with these massive corporations coming into our homes. What I didn't say, though, is that, yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, it is about speculation. It is about profit maximization. 
And the reason, so I've been asked to participate in a couple of hearings on the congressional level around this issue. And I just fully understand the reason that all of these hearings are happening. And the reason this is getting so much attention from really mainstream media outlets is not because they care about terrible conditions for tenants. It's because home ownership rates are threatened, right? And so congressional representatives want to do something that responds to their constituents not being able to buy homes because that is like the sliced white bread in this country. You know, it's just kind of the default position that gets privileged and prioritized, but ultimately, you know, centering everything that we do in this country around the kind of wealth you can only accrue if you own a home is a huge problem, right? You shouldn't have to own a home in order to have your medical expenses covered. You shouldn't have to own a home if you want to go to college, if you want to support your family members going to college. You shouldn't have to own a home if you want to hopefully retire comfortably someday. All of these assumptions baked into our macro economy are deeply problematic if they're premised on something that so many people in this country aren't going to have access to. And when they do have access to it, like I mentioned, it can oftentimes be incredibly predatory. So yeah, I mean, I, I just love the things that Bamas and, and uh, Dr. DeFilippis are naming. You know, we need to really start from the premise, what does it mean for us to ensure that everybody has access to truly affordable, permanently affordable, high quality housing, where people actually have some kind of democratic accountability and democratic decision-making so that it is jointly governed. And, and so, yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I think our position, we recognize our North Star is make, is like the true way to begin to repair the harm that racial capitalism, particularly in housing has wrought, especially on communities of color is communal ownership of land. And that means there's a ton of work to do to break down why privileging home ownership is, is harmful for all of us. Yeah, thanks. If, if I might add to that, I, you know, I, I think there's a lot there. What to me, I think that I just heard that I really wanted to just underscore is scaling means scaling the movement. Chainbaker is a base building, power building organization, right? I said at the beginning, we're not a housing organization. We don't know how to make housing happen, right? But we know that it doesn't happen unless the political will is there. I'd say the political courage is there. When there is that, when there is political will, when people in power decide that they want to get something done, they get it done. The money is there in this country. The resources are there in this country. It is fundamentally about shifting how we use those resources and how we think about them. And I think that there is a lot of tension and there's a lot of questions that we need to ask. It, what's in the bottom of the question of, of, or at least what I'm hearing is a challenge to even the idea of collective ownership. and. Sh what I hear about that a lot is, should we even think about um, land as something to be owned? Should we even think about it in these terms? Yes, we should challenge that for sure. I think that we might be able to have that conversation better if we're in a position of saying, well, what about an individual ownership? Or what about just for profit? To me, I think this is about opening the door to the reality of making it happen, but also trying to undo what is hundreds and hundreds of years of colonialism. That's effectively what gentrification is. And, and I think that that is deeply felt in people. And so some of the issues that are being brought up, we hear this all the time. People are like, well, rent control is controversial or a CLT is controversial. It's like actually not in my community, honestly. We knock on doors and we say, do you think this is controversial? People say, this is the most obvious thing we can think of, actually. Where it becomes controversial is the higher you get up towards a decision maker because there's different power pressures being put upon them. And I don't want to ignore that those are real things, but that's why we need to do organizing. That's why we need to scale that movement. That's why we need to actually build a real housing justice movement that can have and harness the conversation about, well, yeah, maybe we, maybe collective ownership is still problematic. And, and um, you know, maybe it's just a step towards something or maybe we should go a different direction. We're so far away from that because this, this for-profit real estate focused sort of individual American dream home ownership thing is so encrusted in, in our 
politics and our mentality that we really have to work to undo that, which is really, I think, work about decolonizing. And I think that, that there is another question in the chat here too, if I can kind of bridge those two things together about financing and if the city finances the CLT, should they re retain uh, control over that? And I guess that some of that brings some of the similar questions. Maybe, I think, you know, there are definitely that happens around the country. There are uh, cities that own that. And I think that also, again, it boils down to, well, so what are the values being expressed by this here? Because cities give away land all the time. I mean, cities actually pay corporations to take land away from people all the time. So it, it hearing just, well, what if the city just donates the land and finances it? It sounds like a real big step because of where we're at in terms of the power structure. And so I think that, you know, there's a reality, especially for the folks on this call that are city workers or their city planners or the perhaps politicians or funders. That's real. I'm not trying to dismiss it. But the solution is building power and doing grassroots organizing from the people who are most directly impacted by it. Because when we have the power, we can make the change. Two tiny little things. First of all, you know, New York, um, we had the de Blasio administration. There was a great group called 596 Acres that was documenting every $1 property that was publicly owned that was sold to a for-profit developer for a dollar by New York City. And they went under, unfortunately, in uh, 2018. But from 2014 to 2018, they um, documented more than 200 publicly owned pieces of land that were turned over to for-profit developers for a buck each. You know, and then they turn around to us and there's nothing. Second thing is I do think we need to be really thoughtful. And I want to follow on Tomas's question about sort of where is collective ownership, you know, sort of, you know, like where does it leave us or where is it on the way to something? Um, I also think we need to be really thoughtful about the contradictions within collective ownership because there are co-op ownership is not the same as CLT ownership. And we have to be really clear about the ways in which tenant ownership um, connects to community ownership and the ways in which they actually are in tension with each other, right? And, and, and you know, and we have in New York, um, you know, a, a TOPA bill um, and a COPA bill, Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act and the Community Opportunity to Purchase Act, one at the city level, one at the state level, right? And they're real conversations. We brought in, you know, organizers in from DC to kind of talk us through kind of with the DC experience with TOPA, you know, and, and what to learn from, you know, how to kind of do that work. But I think we also have to be really thoughtful as we're building the movement about sort of finding where there are tensions and understanding them and not glossing over them, you know, and being really sort of clear eyed about what those are. That brings me to another question. And we have about 10 minutes left. I want to encourage people to drop any questions in the Q&A chat box. James, I, I think where your comments bring me is, you know, in the report we talked about at the top of the webinar, we kind of draw out these really strong political alignments between real estate developers, politicians, private equity, and private homeowners, right? And how that political alignment has become such a powerful force in driving gentrification and in driving the housing, uh, housing prices up. And it's, you know, it's pretty easy for those folks to see where their political alignment benefits each other. Um, but what I uh, want to kind of give people some space to do now is kind of share where are you all kind of inspired by the movement, making connections and aligning around, as we said, scaling up the housing justice movement. So where are you seeing, you know, the movement making connections to push back against those forces and, and start to shift what we're seeing, whether it's in a municipality, whether it's in a city, whether it's a community land trust, just where are you, where are you being inspired right now by the housing just in housing justice movement and the connections um, that folks are making across constituencies um, and issues that's starting to make a difference. And I'll start with um, Sophia. Sure, thanks. Oh, I feel like I have the privilege of being inspired on a daily basis by the organizations that I get to work with. I, you know, I think people are doing such, um, I don't know, such difficult and brave things out of, uh, out of, you know, a very genuine need within their own homes and the circumstances that are impacting them within their own homes. Um, you know, I think most recently I have been in touch with folks, let's take Miami, for example, an organization called Miami Worker Center, just one attendance bill of rights. 
in that city and speaking with some of those folks, I know that they were inspired by Casey Tennant's also winning uh, Tennant School of Rights in the Kansas City area. And I think these kinds of relationships where people see what folks are organizing for in one geography and doing it in a way that respects their own you know, unique circumstances in a different city somewhere else is really inspiring and look forward to seeing more of those kinds of wins taking place. I think another example, you know, I've heard so much from folks who are interested in things like collective bargaining rights in the, in the buildings that they live in and making sure that landlords actually have to sit down at the table and recognize tenant unions and that, you know, there's this case in San Francisco with the Housing Rights Committee of San Francisco where that city recently implemented mandatory collective bargaining rights for all tenant associations within buildings. So tenants can actually withhold rent or pay it into escrow if the management of their building doesn't actually meet with them. And to me, I think, I don't know, I situate all of these in so much you kind of framed this, like there are steps along the way to this bigger vision of the housing that we actually need. And I just feel so excited and so grateful when I have the opportunity to work with people who are actually notching these kinds of wins. I'd say particularly in places where, you know, I live in Texas, things are kind of bleak here, let's say. But, and so I just, I get so excited when I, when I hear of wins in places that are perhaps not the most likely of jurisdictions where you think that tenants would be able to build the kind of power, or rather you expect the tenants would build the kind of power, you wouldn't necessarily expect that local governments would be amenable, but I, you know, I think when we organize, we win, right? And I think that all of these cases are evidence of that being true. Tomas? Yeah, I think, I think that uh, you said it well, when we organize, we win, and I'm just constantly inspired by all of, the, all of the people we've come into contact that are doing this work across the country. Of course, by our members who just refuse to give up, even though they're facing many reasons to give up. Um, they refuse and they keep moving forward. I think knowing that we're calling for 64 acres of community land trust here in Santa Fe is, is something that is, a, I think, a very, not only an uphill battle, it's kind of an audacious thing to call for, especially in a town like Santa Fe. Just knowing that there was, of course, there was a question in our members' minds. They were very mindful when they chose this campaign, but it was done based on the belief that we're just talking about that, you know, it's worth fighting for. And, and if we can move that line at all in Santa Fe, then maybe that'll help folks in Texas. Maybe that'll help folks in New York um, because we are part of a larger movement and, and we need to scale up the movement and we want to win here in Santa Fe, but we know that, you know, if you're winning in Texas or New York or California or, or you know, Mississippi, then, you're, then you're, we're building that movement together. And so Chainmaker is part of a national alliance called Right to the City Alliance. Um, we have a national campaign called Homes for All, which is bringing together groups just like Chainbreaker just like the folks that are talking about here that are coming at housing from a social justice or racial justice lens. Um, and that's where so much of my um, inspiration comes from outside of the city of Santa Fe. So um, definitely taking, taking a sort of embodying the, the concept of what we call translocal organizing, knowing that it's localized here in Santa Fe, but we're still part of a larger movement. Can I talk about not uh, housing justice for a quick sec. I am most inspired. The thing that most excites me is all of the remarkable forms of community created and community controlled finance that have emerged in the last several years. If there's a part of our movement that we need to do more learning from the really excellent people at like say Boston and Jima or downtown Crenshaw Rising in LA, you know, even if they didn't get that mall, they did raise a ton of money. East Bay Real Estate um, Investment Cooperative and a whole set, um, you know, further up in, in California and a whole set of, of really interesting models that I think we need to kind of like reproduce more, right? You know, because that, because a central part of what we're going to be doing as we're building out our different way of housing and living, right? You know, and, and to use some of the way that Tomas has been talking about it, you know, very productively, I think, in, um, uh, in, in our conversation, you know, the finance, the finance that we have ain't going to do it. And we need to be building out a, a lot more and building up on the really thoughtful and creative and exciting models, you know, like, um, you know, Nia at Boston and Gima, 
Like you guys should totally have her on, you know, just let her do a winner. Um, she's all kinds of awesome. And, you know, like that's what I'm most excited about the last year or two. That's great. We have about two minutes and I'm sorry because we have some questions that have come into the Q&A that unfortunately we're not going to be able to get to all of them. But there's one uh, question, if anyone wants to kind of take this last question um, before we close out, um, this is from Ty. Um, I also have a brother named Ty, so hi Ty. Are there any conversations, collaborations internationally on community land trusts that any of you are aware of that we can draw on and help build some ideas from? So I, I guess that's a question of how international is the housing justice movement right now? I can start, I guess. It's become incredibly international uh, in the last several years, actually. One of the striking things, I mean, it's funny, right? Because the CLT form itself emerges from a whole kind of like mishmash of international inspiration, right? Like, you know, whether it be the Gramdan movement in India or um, the Ajito in Mexico, you know, you know, so it's already a kind of grab back. It's happening all over. Um, there's some great organizing in, in Sydney around d indigenous CLT organizing. And then, of course, um, Kenya Martin in San Juan uh, is a great set of organizers. When Hurricane Maria hit, it was a big deal for us in New York. There, it's a lot of conversation about how we could support uh, our siblings in, in, in San Juan. You know, because it, there's obviously a lot of connections between the island and New York City. Thank you for that, James. Uh, wow. I mean, this went by really fast. Um, unfortunately, we are at eight o'clock. Um, we are at end of tonight's conversation. I feel like we could continue this conversation and keep this going for a long time. But I think organizationally, we have some Zoom sympathy um, that we try to hold webinars that are not too long um, because many of us um, have been in front of a computer um, all day. But with that being said, we greatly, greatly appreciate the panelists and all the participants that joined. We will definitely share this full uh, webinar on our website. And for everyone who signed up and came on tonight, you'll get a link to re-watch. The resources were placed in the chat. And so thank you again for our panelists. Thank you for our participants and have a good night, everybody. Thank you again for having inviting me. Likewise. Bye. Thank you.